This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. YouTube has demonetized almost all of my recent videos, so if you're able, please consider supporting this channel by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. So we are now just under 1,000 deaths a day from this virus, roughly 70,000 infections per day. ICUs are nearly full, and the state is preparing for the outbreak to get much worse. As just yesterday, on Sunday, an additional 86 people died here in Arizona. So we do have to try to get kids back into school. We need to be mindful that we may see a wave of these post-viral syndromes happening right when we're trying to do that. Another looming situation facing Arizona, the opening of schools set for next month. There is no nothing in the data that would suggest that kids being back in school is, uh, is dangerous to them. One law firm is offering free wills for Wisconsin teachers. Teachers. These Oklahoma teachers scrambling to draft their wills. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to make it. I'm immunocompromised. So what we want to do is we want to get our schools open. We want to get them open quickly, beautifully in the fall. It's very important for our country. It's very important for the well-being of the student and the parents. So we're going to be putting a lot of pressure on open your schools in the fall. The end of summer and the beginning of a new school year is something that most parents eagerly look forward to and that their children dread. This year, things are a little different. While many working-age parents are hoping to be able to send their kids back to school so they can go to work, those kids do actually have something to be afraid of this time. With the U.S. facing a surge of new coronavirus cases amid our complete failure to contain the disease, funneling millions of children into high-density schools seems like a good way to make things even worse. In this episode, we're going to talk about the push to reopen schools for the fall semester, and why that's a terrible idea. Before we begin, let's go over the current situation. Since the COVID situation is evolving so rapidly, this information is obviously subject to change. So be aware that the following data was collected on July 20th, 2020, and reflects the most up-to-date information at the time of writing this script. We are currently experiencing the worst period yet of new cases and deaths. Thanks to our uniquely terrible response to the pandemic, the United States stands alone as the worst case scenario for the spread of the disease. At least 33 countries have banned travelers from the US in an attempt to protect their citizens from the rampant incompetence of the world's greatest superpower. The epicenter of COVID infections has shifted from cities like New York to places like Texas and Florida, each of which is struggling to keep up with the surge of cases, often running out of hospital beds in populous counties. As Texas posts record numbers of new cases, often over 10,000 per day, the country seems to have simply given up on trying to contain the virus. In a previous video, I said that, based on historical trends, if we reopened the country before we had a handle on the disease, cases would spike and we'd be forced to shut everything down again, and then we'd be worse off than when we started. As much as I enjoy being right and telling people I told you so, this time it's been incredibly disheartening to watch. Before this new surge in cases, all 50 states had started to reopen in some capacity. As of right now, 17 states remain fully reopened, 8 are in the process of reopening, 13 have paused their reopening measures, and 9 have been forced to backtrack, including Texas and Florida, where state leadership had been eager to reopen. Even now, with their states in crisis and the eyes of the world upon them, Ted Cruz won't wear a mask on commercial flights, and Ron DeSantis is pushing for reopening schools. It's obvious why America felt the need to reopen so long before we were ready. Our nation falls apart if there aren't workers to produce value. Without shipping and trucking, we can't distribute or export goods, crippling some of the world's largest corporations. Without retail stores, the country's consumption engine begins to stall. But thanks to our negligence in creating a nationwide standard of worker protections, American employees are stuck between a rock and a hard place, an inability to pay their bills or afford medical care on the one hand, and returning to work and contracting a deadly disease on the other. Unsurprisingly, the U.S. chose to sacrifice its citizens on the altar of the free market, and wouldn't you know it, stock prices went up and thousands died from the virus. The impressive thing about the capitalist meat grinder that is the American economy is that human sacrifice works. Sure, some of your workers may die, but the value of what they produce is vastly greater than what they're paid, so it's no trouble to replace them. And so the cycle will continue. Reopen, spike, stocks go up, more people die, backpedal a bit, and repeat. All the while repeating the mantra that we're all in this together and we're doing the best we can. Both of those statements are lies. Now those same people are suggesting that we need to reopen our schools. Let's talk about that. What are the current guidelines for preventing the spread of COVID? First and foremost, wear a mask. This is the most important part in keeping yourself and others safe. Just looking at this video should be enough to show you that masks work. 
Another critical part of the equation is maintaining at least six feet between yourself and others. Social distancing dramatically reduces the rate at which the virus spreads from person to person, and that has been the case for each pandemic we've faced in the past. Because the universe has a cruel sense of humor, there were anti-mask leagues during the 1918 flu pandemic. And guess what happened when there were large concentrations of those people in one area? The same thing that's happening today. It was a stupid hill to literally die on back then, and it's even more ridiculous today because we've seen it happen before. The final piece of advice from the medical community, if we're ignoring just staying home because apparently that's impossible, is to wash your hands frequently and thoroughly, and generally just follow good hygiene protocols. To recap, wear a mask, stay away from other people, and keep yourself, especially your hands, clean. Now imagine any child you know. Is that child capable of following these guidelines for nine hours a day with limited supervision? Of course not. Children, bless their little hearts, do some of the dumbest things imaginable. They climb all over each other, they can't follow even the simplest instructions, they'll do whatever they're not supposed to do as soon as the teacher isn't looking, and their idea of fun is spitting on each other and licking doorknobs. Not exactly the ideal group to dictate strict guidelines to. Over the course of this pandemic, we've seen fully grown adults throw fits when someone suggests they wear a mask. We've seen anti-mask protests, people claiming COVID is a Chinese hoax, people who simply don't care if they get the disease because, quote, it's not even as bad as the flu. If supposedly mature, responsible adults can't even follow these basic guidelines, how can we expect boisterous little kids to do it? Or if those same anti-mask whiners have kids, what do you think the odds are they've taught their children to be responsible and wear a mask at school? Heck, those kids probably already have the virus thanks to their idiot parents. So, we stick roughly 57 million kids in school this fall. Most of them don't follow guidelines because they're kids and they don't understand or just don't care. Millions of them get infected. They infect their teachers, many of whom are drafting wills in case they die. The kids then carry the infection back home with them. Their parents get infected. And we're even worse off than we are now. This is what will happen if we try to reopen schools in the fall. I'm going to be very honest here. As difficult as it is to come to grips with the fact that all learning must take place online this year, anyone who supports reopening schools is part of the problem. If you are a parent, you're not being a good one. Sending your children into these plague dens is incredibly irresponsible. If you're a teacher, your first charge is to care for your students and provide a safe learning environment. That is impossible in physical schools right now. Thankfully, many parents and teachers have been very vocal about wanting the nation's schools to remain closed for at least the rest of the year. This is the right approach. But let's have a listen to what advocates for reopening have to say. Yeah, the president has said um, unmistakably that he wants schools to open, and I was just in the Oval talking to him about that. And when he says open, he means open and full, kids being able to attend each and every day at their school. Uh, the science should not stand in the way of this. Uh, and as Dr. Scott Atlas said, I thought this was a good quote. Of course we can do it. Everyone else in the Western world, our peer nations, are doing it. We are the outlier here. Uh, the science is very clear on this. Uh, that, you know, for instance, you look at the JAMA pediatric study of 46 pediatric hospitals in North America that said the risk of critical illness from COVID is far less for children than that of seasonal flu. The science is on our side here, uh, and we encourage for localities and states to just simply follow the science, open our schools. It's very damaging to our children. There's a lack of reporting of abuse. Uh, there's mental uh, depressions that are not addressed, suicidal ideations that are not addressed when students are not in school. Our schools are extremely important they're essential and they must reopen. First of all, when you hear the science should not stand in the way of reopening, that should be a huge red flag. Sure, the science says many of these children will die, but they gotta go back, you know? Nope, that's insane. But let's address some of the other points. First, she said everyone else in the world is doing it. Yeah, but the rest of the world handled the crisis responsibly and beat their outbreaks. We have not. We're worse off than ever. Just because the rest of the world gets to do something doesn't mean we get to as well. That's just the US acting like the spoiled superpower it is. She goes on to say, the risk for children is far less than that of the seasonal flu. Okay, so you're saying it's a numbers game. You're saying there's an acceptable level of infection and risk of death here. How many children dying is acceptable to you? 500? 1,000? 5,000? There's a vaccine for the flu. There's no vaccine for coronavirus. Children will die if we put them all in schools together. Of course, this is the United States we're talking about. We're used to children being killed in school. Ignoring the fact that these people seem very willing to sacrifice thousands of children for the sake of normalcy, she goes on to say that while schools are closed, there are mental health issues that are not addressed. This is true. 
The pandemic has taken quite a toll on the mental state of many people, children included. If only there were some way to guarantee that all these people had access to the mental health care they need. Something that was available to everybody. A sort of universal health care, if you will. I'm being snarky, but here's the thing. What the White House press secretary is suggesting is that by opening schools, mental health issues will go away. Obviously, that's not the case. A trip to the school nurse isn't going to solve anything. What would help in a situation like this is universal health care, which neither Donald Trump nor Joe Biden supports. If we truly cared about the well-being of our students, we would make sure that their mental health care needs could be addressed regardless of their parents' financial situation. With health insurance tied to employment in the U.S., since so many people have lost their jobs, they've also lost their health insurance, which means they will not be able to pay the medical bills when their children contract coronavirus. And they certainly won't be able to afford mental health services, which are often not covered by employer health insurance in the first place. The people pushing for schools to reopen do not care about the safety of the children. They have an agenda. Take, for example, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos. DeVos, who has never worked a single day in a public school, has consistently downplayed the danger of reopening and has even threatened to withhold funding for public schools that don't reopen. If schools aren't going to reopen and not fulfill that promise, they shouldn't get the funds. Then give it to the families to decide to go to a school that is going to meet that promise. Well, you can't it's do that. I mean, I know, I know you people. guys Let's support vouchers, and promise. that's a. I know you support vouchers, and that's and that's a reasonable argument. But it, you can't do that unilaterally. You have to do that through Congress. Let's think about this for a minute. What possible motive could Betsy DeVos, a known crusader for charter schools, have for pushing public schools to reopen? It's not hard to put two and two together here. She knows all those kids will be at tremendous risk of infection. She wants public schools to fail to keep children safe, so she can say, look, see, private schools are better. Let's defund public schools so we can dump more money into already wealthy areas to send their kids to charter schools. What she's doing here is honestly just straight up evil. She is actively hoping for enough children to get sick and even die that she can achieve her goal. These are the people that are pushing to reopen schools. They're not doing it for the good of the children. They're doing it to advance their own interests, to defund public schools, to free up their workers to come work in hazardous conditions for the sake of the stock market, to force an appearance of normalcy to boost re-election chances. There are a lot of powerful people behind this push to reopen. But parents, teachers, and students all have a lot of power here, especially teachers. There are almost 4 million teachers across the country. If they can come together and say, no, we're going to protect our students, there's not much those in power will be able to do. Parents and young people, support your teachers. Send them letters of thanks and encouragement. Ask them to stand up for you and for your future. Tell those in power that reopening schools in this moment is not acceptable. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is supported by my patrons on Patreon. This type of video, while very important, is something that sponsors won't touch. In order to pay the bills and keep this channel running, I rely on AdSense revenue, sponsors, and donations from generous viewers. By producing explicitly anti-capitalist content, I lose out on both AdSense and sponsors. If you enjoy the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. You can find my Patreon page at patreon.com slash secondthought. We also have a lively and growing Discord for patrons of every tier. You can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.